Um, my name is Jialiu. I'm a researcher at AIER. I'm the one of the oldest researchers at AIER. I'm so glad Plena is here because she's the oldest one. But I'm a young economist, and I just got out of school two years ago. Um, my specialty is monetary policy and uh, theory, and also financial economics. Today, I'm going to talk about how to normalize the US monetary policy and what's the new normal. <coughs> Um, last night, when Marsha called today's meeting at class, I got terrified. <laughs> I had to skip the uh, lovely guitar playing party and come <laughs> back to my office to put more intuitional stuff on my slides. And um, when my colleague asked me earlier how many slides I'm going to have, I, I told her probably 20 slides, but I guess I lied. I got 36 slides. But <laughs> Natalia got very lively time reminder cards for me because she said, she said, I have tendency to go over every time. So today, I will try my best to stay in the schedule. We, we sympathize because we all get our stories cut. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. But you guys do not have any meetings scheduled in the afternoon, do you? So maybe I can take your afternoon. <laughs> OK, um, I'm going to talk about normalization of the US monetary policy and the new normal. Plena has already said she didn't like the name of new normal. Um, actually, my old colleague, he came up with the name new normal. I didn't like it in the first place, but I settled. Because that is going to be extremely important for us to accept. There are so many changes have already happened in our economy. And if it have, have already existed for so long, and it will persist for a long time of period in the future, we have to accept that it, it is going to be the new normal. So going forward, any policy objectives have to be based on this new normal. I will tell you more detail why and what is those new normal. Before I get into that, I would like to start with this question. What is the current state of our economy and the financial system? Some of you might think the economy is doing well. We are on the right track. Everything is looking great. Others might disagree. The economy looks horrible, and we are still in a deep reset, recession. So let's take a look at the different aspects of the economy. First of all, the overall economic growth. Economic growth data looks solid. Um, in, 2000, it, uh, in 2010, 2.5% of GDP growth. And 2011, 1.8. 2012, 2.8. And last year, 2013, it, it was 1.9%. So, looks solid economic growth. But the first quarter of this year, the growth stopped. We only got 0.1% annual rate. And luckily, we have a weather to blame. <laughs> but the export is the major driver of this stopped growing economy. But as I know of, on the other export is the international or outside demand of the US goods or services. As I know of, on the other side of Earth, weather was lovely. <laughs> So, <laughs> economic growth has picked up since 2009, okay, we are smiling, but will the growth pace be sustainable? We have so many things to worry about. It's not just the weather, but it's nice for you to have something to blame, but there's no way you can measure it. And the labor market, Polina has talked a lot about labor market, so I'm going to skip this. <laughs> Substantial improvement, <laughs> unemployment has gone down to 6.3%, which is better than expected. But in the rate is still elevated. And like we have discussed earlier this morning, this labor participa participation rate has reached the record high. And long-term employment has been um, raising some concern. Inflation. Okay, this is kind of um, 
good sign about the economy. We, I don't have many debate about inflation because no matter you use PCE price level or you use CPI, inflation has stayed below the Federal Reserve's target for years. But we have abundant free liquidity sitting in the banking system. Once they get loaned out, that could be inflationary credit expansion. So eight, it's um, the increasing likelihood, it's very likely that longer term inflation might take place in the future. Consumer spending. Consumer spending seems like get improved continuously. But to me, the basics of um, increasing my spending is my income. Okay? You might tell me credit card is free money. Why don't you just use your credit card? But in this nation, in this country, when we have so much credit card debt, I think income, your income, if you can make more money, or at least you can keep your income, is going to be the route for you to increase in your spending. Um, the housing market looks good. But uh, beginning this year, 2014, the growth rate somewhat slowed. So they're still worrisome. And uh, we are talking about we might relax the uh, regulation for the mortgage to um, further improve the housing market. So the housing market is still um, concerns the, uh, the policymakers. Financial system. I don't have smiley face for this sector. <laughs> Everything is bad. So we lower the interest rate. Interest rate, no matter the short rates or the long rates, they all have been very low for years. But look at the borrowing and the lending. We lower the interest rate in order to encourage lending or borrowing, but the volume of lending and borrowing remains stubbornly low. And, okay, interest rate didn't work. Let's print more money to encourage investment or, or consumer spending. So we put a lot of liquid in the financial system, but all of them, okay, um, most of them, have been sitting in the banking system. It did not go out to create money or help businesses. And the reason is the, the bank expansion multiplier is not functioning. We have liquid, we have money sitting in the bank, but money did not get loaned out. So that is multiplier which measures like uh, how fast or how much the money gets uh, expanded. Okay, so what do we do? We printed money, it didn't work. We lowered the interest rate, it didn't work. So let's lower interest rate further. But it's not possible because short-term interest rate, which is the policy, uh, the Federal Reserve's policy rate, it has been near zero. So normally no, Nominal short rates cannot go below zero. It cannot be negative. You cannot ask people to pay you money. No. You cannot pay people money to borrow money from you. You wouldn't like to do that. So we are out of options, out of policy tools. Nothing good in the financial system. So going forward, when we are talking about how to normalize all these unconventional policies, I think we have to ask first, what is normal? You want to go back to normal, what things look like in normal times? And then, what is the current state of affairs? Like all these changing, all these changes going on, like Plina said, the changing nature of recessions, the unconventional policies which have been conducted, all these abnormal things happened. And what stays, what goes? So we have to identify what is going to be the new element of the financial system. And then, after identification, where do we want to be? What is the feasible or possible objectives for the Federal Reserve to conduct the policy? Yes, you have a lot of good thinking. You want to be there, you want to be there. But what is possible, what is feasible? Where do we want to be in, in practice? 
And how do we get there? That's that strategy. How do we get there? And what is the results? What is the consequences if you take uh, this action or you take the other? What is the consequences? Let's look at the normal. What is normal? It is tempting to think monetary policy and the financial system have been fairly fixed. It is tempting to think that. But in reality, in fact, both financial system and monetary policy have undergone a lot of changes in the last century. First, in 1913, the founding of the Fed. OK, that's the start start of bad stories. And um, by the middle 1920s, the Fed started con conducting its open market operations. But at the time, these market operations were much simpler than now. And the Fed wasn't quite sure what to do with it. And in the 1930s, we had the worst Great Depression. It completely revised the financial system and abandoned the gold standard because people believed at the time the, the major reason for the Great Depression is the Fed um, contracted money supply too much. There wasn't enough money <coughs> outside to support the, eco the, the, um, the e economic growth. So we have to abandon this gro the gold standard because if you stake your currency to gold, it limits your ability to create money. Like now, Fed can just go ahead, print money as much as they want. But at the time, when the gold standard it was um, effective, they, they could not do that. And people believe that was the bottleneck of the economic growth. So they abandoned the gold standard in the 1930s. And then in the 1940s, the Bretton Woods Agreement um, put us back on the term of the gold standard. So people changed their mind, let's use the gold standard again. But in the 1973, um, they abandoned this Bretton Woods Agreement again, and exchange rate finally got floated freely. But um, by the end of 1970s, well, actually, the discussion have been going on back to 1950s, but by the 1970s, the Fed finally had a dual mandate, the long-term uh, employment and inflation. And um, beginning of the 1980s, okay, the Fed usually conduct the policy targeting the interest rate. It worked fine. but. Um, at the end of 1970s, as we all know, we have the stagflation, hyperinflation. People got panicked. So the Federal Reserve decided to target money supply instead of interest rate. That's why if you take a look at the Federal Funds rate, <coughs> the short-term um, policy rate, it reached a peak of 20% at the time because they abandoned their targeting their interest rate target. They targeted money supply instead. But soon, they find out money supply and money velocity were not reliable. So they put uh, interest rate targeting back to the forefront of the monetary policy. So they changed it again. So this so-called great uh, monetarist is the one time, is a time when the Fed was targeting the money supply instead of the interest rate. Um, and oh, here's the good story. From the middle 1980s and 2000s, middle of 2000s, the great mod moderation. Everyone believed, well, maybe not everyone, but uh, at least most of people, including s famous scholars, they believe monetary policy has been permanently improved. And that was the reason why in the business cycle we didn't have a major economic downturn for 20 years. Everything was fine. And um, um, if I recall it correctly, Robert Lucas, 
He had a speech in EEA conference in 2003, Eastern Economic Association. He said, um, he said, um, let me see, um, that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, he said that great moderation is going to last forever. Okay? And uh, that, that the next recession is not going to happen. He's, the title of his speech is something like the fundamental reason of uh, economic recessions have been resolved. In other words, economic recessions are unlikely to happen in the future. In 2004, Ben Bernanke had another public speech in EEA. Oh, did I say EEA for? No, it's AEA, American Economic Asso Asso Association, in 2003 for Robert Lucas. Ben Bernanke in 2004 in EEA, Eastern Economic Asso Association Conference in 2004, he said, this grid moderation is reliable and it is contributed by the improvement of monetary policy. So for scholars, you better not study monetary policy anymore. <laughs> you should switch your uh, study, your research to physical policy because there's nothing to do left for the visit. <laughs> but you know what? In a couple of years, the worst than ever recession began in 2007, right after, not right after, a couple of years later, after all these major scholars had the public speech about how the uh, monetary policy has helped with the economy mm -hmm. and how this recession is not going to happen again. So I guess that's the beauty of economics. People like you get to say, economists are getting things wrong all the time. <laughs> but economists like me get to say, well, there's always more room for us to improve. <laughs> and you know what? We are not ashamed of that. Um, so um, this overconfidence of the economic professions or the general public has contributed to this introduction or creation of security market, I mean, or these housing bubbles. Like, um, like this security market is like, especially let me take a housing market for example. If I get mortgage from a bank, the bank feels more confidence to give the mortgage because, because of the securities they invented they can sell this mortgage to another financial inst institutions. So if I go default, the bank could, um, they pay these financial institutions for take the mortgage backed securities. So once I go bankruptcy, they don't have to take the risk. These financial institutions will pay for the bank to lose the mortgage. So they think there's no risk for them. So, so they overly take the mortgage. They offer everyone the mortgage. I'm glad I was too young to experience that, but maybe some of you had this experience. You got phone call all the time from the bank. And again, this is not my personal experience. It's a secondhand story. The bank even called the dead people. <laughs> they just called every phone number they can get. Even these people have already died. They call them, hey, do you want a mortgage? Do you want to buy a house? <laughs> so this over risk taking and the closer link among banking, like you think you had your risk, but the risk did not disappear. It stays in the whole system, in the financial system as a whole. So once you get mortgage from me and I sell, this mortgage-backed security to her. What if her, what if she goes bankruptcy? So everyone is connected now. So you think you are perfectly safe. But once the system clapped, there's no way for you to escape. So closer links among um, financial institutions, the security markets through the um, 1990s, it uh, filled the bubble. And finally, if it's a bubble, it bursts sooner or later. 
So the bubble burst in 2007 and a major worldwide recession began. So this is the last century. We have much more unpleasant events going on. I just list some of them. So there's, there have been a lot of changes. So now here I need to ask you, is it appropriate to think in terms of going back to a normal monetary policy? There is no normal monetary policy to begin with in the first place. We are always changing thanks to the changing nature of the recession, thanks to the limited knowledge of economists, everything is changing. So there's no normal in the first place a new operating framework must be created rather than an old framework restored. That is my point of view. So what is a new normal and what stays and what goes? First of all, I would like to say this easing policy since 2009, the Fed has been printing money um, by buying a large set, uh, scale sets, which create a abundant the Fed assets. So prior to the crisis, the Fed sets is only like 900 billion, but now it's, uh, it can be expected to reach 2.5 <coughs> trillion by the end of this year. From 900 billion to 4.5 trillion. And if you look at the components of the assets, most of them are um, treasury uh, bonds and mortgage-backed securities. And for treasury securities, 65% of them have terms for uh, more than five years. And for mortgage-backed securities, almost all of them have maturities of more than 10 years. So if the Fed rule out selling them off, they're gonna stay for at least, at least five years. Or for mortgage-backed securities, it will be 10 years if they do not sell them off. So I would say going forward, at least in the near term, these um, long-term assets held by the Fed would last in the future, at least in the near term. The second, is the payment of interest on bank reserves. We have 2.5 trillion bank reserves so far, and we pay 25 basis points as interest on that. The reason why the Fed did that was, we had a discussion in our group that uh, uh, one of the reasons is the Fed was trying to provide the capitals to the bank, to banks to help with their balance sheet to try to make their balance sheet look better. But I think the primary reason why the Fed did that was to keep the free liquidity from flooding into the financial system. Because they want to give banks money to help them out. But at the meantime, they don't want those large liquidity getting outside because too much money, which cannot transact the volume of goods and services, what's the result? inflation. The Fed has zero tolerance of infl inflation, so I would say the Fed will continue paying this 25% basis point on uh, bank reserves for a long time of period because they have zero to tolerance of inflation. And this interest paid on bank reserves also caused some arbitrage opportunities. For example, um, the three months treasury bill, interest rate now is like three basis points. So as a bank, if you were a bank, you could invest on this three months treasury bill. You pay only three basis points, and then you deposit this liquidity, these reserves, into Federal Reserve. So you get 25 basis points as your rate of return. 25, you get 25 basis points, you only pay three basis points. So this is arbitrage <coughs> opportunity. Um, as a result of uh, number one and number two new elements, short-term interest rates have been at record low levels for years. I only have 
put the three short, short reads as example here. Um, they have been near zero for many, many years, as we all know. And the number fourth, the number four, is with this abundant reserve sitting in a bank, and we pay interest on these bank reserves, what is the result? The Fed has lost control over the flow of funds in the financial system. Why? Because in normal times, how the Fed controls over the short rate is um, they do those things on the federal funds market. First of all, the central bank sells or purchases government securities in order to drain or increase the bank reserves. Like, I'm, I'm going to sell you uh, the, uh, the treasury bond. So as a bank, you're going to buy it for the interest, okay? And then, at the end of the day, you realize, oh, I have reserve requirements to meet. So now, since I buy all this treasury bill from the central bank for interest, I'm out of fund, I'm out of liquidity to meet my reserve requirements, so I have to borrow reserve from other banks. And the rate at this borrowing from each other in Tulum is called federal funds rate, okay? And this is a policy rate. So by doing that, the Fed gets to control over the federal funds rate. And the banks, they borrow <coughs> short time, they took short money like uh, over a, at an overnight basis, and then they create longer term loans. They borrow, they keep borrowing because the short loans has the lower rate of return, so they pay less. And then they create longer term loans. As you all know, longer term is considered riskier, so they get more. So that is how the bank makes profit. So, and this is how um, the yield curve gets spinned from the short rates to long rates. So in this case, in this sense, that is how the central bank gets to control all the rates at all maturities, from short term and to long term. Okay. But now, the problem is, with abundant reserves, uh, all banks have in, this, in the financial system, in the banking system, and actually, central bank pays 25 basis points. If you were the bank, you wouldn't like to buy any more short-term treasury bonds from the central bank for less than 25 basis points. And even you do that, you, even you do that, you will not be out short of liquidity to meet your re, re, reserve requirements because, because you have so much excess reserve. So this open um, market operations is not functioning. And um, this, is, um, this is about these financial regulations, which is not directly controlled by the central bank. But I would like to list it here because it is important for the central bankers to be aware of financial regulations in order to conduct their policy in the future. Like, um, after the financial crisis, those two, this is just examples, those two um, acts or rules has been created to respond to the financial crisis. Like the Dodd-Frank Act, it marked the greatest change to the financial regulations since the 1930s. It was aimed to um, to prevent from more bailouts in the future, like too big to fail. Not gonna happen again. But uh, it's Basel III, it is international banking rules. It is um, meant to improve banks' risk management and strengthen their capital requirements. Um, for example, they, uh, they, increased, they increased the leverage, ra leverage ratio for the banks, and now they require banks to carry higher quality capital, and the, the banks have to rely less on uh, short-term assets. They have to have more longer-term assets, which will limit their ability to 
uh, participate on the short um, federal funds rate market because they are not allowed to carry so much short loans as they can before. So it will um, affect their profit. Also, it will limit their ability to participate in the federal funds market. But, but um, there are some critics talking about what? Okay. <laughs> I do have a tendency to go over schedule. Okay, um, there are some critics talking about um, this, uh, these two restrict financial re regulations and impose too much control on government and it's not gonna work. But Janet Yellen, the new chairman of the Federal Reserve said, um, those financial regulations have longer term benefit to uh, the economy and those benefits have already kicked in. So I guess going forward, they stay, they stay. But that is not going to be directly uh, objective or policy uh, uh, objectives for the Federal Reserve, but it is important for them to realize, okay, this is going to be um, the new financial regulations which will affect the lending and borrowing a lot. They have to be, re they have to be aware of that. Um, the Fed now claims the right, okay, they are already gone, they are already gone, but they claim the right to do it again if any more financial crisis arise in the future. So this is the three em em emergency fac uh, facility um, the central bank created to help uh, financial institutions when the crisis happened. Okay. This is the first time since the 1930s the central bank landed uh, to banks as well as non-banks. So they are already gone, so it's already zero now, but still they came the right to do it again in the future. Okay, the last one, the last one. Um, the long-term assets bar, uh, now the central bank is, uh, in normal times or before, they only <coughs> conduct the policy targeting interest rate. One time, money, money supply, but now, they can target the longer asset market, like the uh, long-term US Treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities. It is expected to end by the end of this year, but the, um, the experience date, so in the future, they could always go back, come back like, hey, we're gonna keep purchasing, we're gonna keep buying, you know, we're not gonna taper. So it is all possibility, but in my view, um, this tapering will not change their pace and uh, the QE program will end at the end of this year. It should, okay. What do we want to be? Mm. First of all, short-term interest rate. The reason I put this chart here, it's not short-term interest rate because short-term interest rate will affect the lending and borrowing a lot. But we lower it to near zero, but it didn't work because the loans um, has been going down dramatically. Well, um, starting here. But yes, um, the bank reserves, the, the, the large amount of bank reserves contributed to this, but um, uh, for lending itself, it went down a lot. So now the rate, I, I believe, now it's the time to raise short-term rates. Why? Because at the end of this year, if the QE program ends and the Fed will be out of tools, okay, they cannot purchase the long-term assets anymore. And short-term rate has been zero. So what can they do? Well, you could argue central bank should, could just do nothing. Maybe we are better off. That's another topic. But now, since they are already here and they are, they are pretty aggressive, they have to do something, but they are out of tools. So raise the interest rates will give them ability to conduct, to target interest rate again, lower interest rate to spur economic growth and, and raise interest rate in order to cool down the economy. Okay, this is what they usually do. So only if you raise the, the short rates above zero, you will have the ability to do that. With the interest, re interest rate staying near zero, Nothing for them to do. <coughs> and the Fed will need to, oh yeah, this is the second. This is the reason I just said. And the, yes, the short-term interest rate targeting has been proving to be a effective tool in the last century. 
And actually, because the Federal Reserve have been, has been um, concerned about higher rate would affect the lending, which is already disappointing. But I would argue if you raise your interest rates after a long-term recession, it actually could increase lending, at least in the short term. Why? Like, if you are looking for a television, that's my story. That is the first-hand information, finally. I was looking for a television. Um, the price has been low forever, but I didn't make a purchase because I believe the price probably would go even lower than now, or at least stay at the same level so there's no hurry. But once the price started going up, I got afraid. Well, yes, the short-term interest rate had been zero, near zero for years. It has to go up. And you believe it will continue to go up because it has been staying too low for too, too long. So after um, the price goes up, start going up, you actually go ahead and make the purchase, which is borrowing in this case. And for the bank, for the bank, if the rate is higher, actually loans, commercial loans become more attractive for them because they make money by, by getting the, rate, um, the interest from people. Higher interest rates will make uh, loans more attractive for banks. So on the demand side and the supply side, they both contribute to a increasing lending and borrowing due to the higher rate, at least in the short term. This a very quick question. Sure. Do you think the spread be the more relevant thing rather than the actual level at which rates are? In other words, if, if Fed funds rate, say, goes up and you know, we were at 25 bips or... Mm -hmm. I, I mean, just in, in general. Um, the way how you affect the, uh, the short-term rates or the longer-term rates, like I discussed, that has to be the central bank to raise the federal funds rate first. And then this is the, the benchmark rate, and it will affect other short-term rates. And then other short-term interest rates will affect longer-term interest rates. <coughs> so right. this is the whole system. Well, But um, <coughs> if there's the, um, if there, <coughs> the rates are higher, so the bank, if the bank loan out the money to you, you have to pay more. So you have to pay more to the banks. So they have all this uh, free liquidity sitting in a central bank. Now, if the central bank only pay them 25 basis points, but you get to get more by loaning them out, of course you are willing to do that. Now you only get uh, like 5%, for like 30 years mortgage, but what if it's maybe 10? Even though with the same amount of risk, you would like to do that because you get a higher rate of return. For banks, the profit are coming from the loan, the interest on loans that people pay them. So higher rate, higher rate makes the loans more attractive to banks. This is historical evidence, Does yes. Make it attractive to it doesn't make attractive to people because the interest rate is the price you pay for your borrowing. So higher interest rate means borrowing becomes more expensive for you. But as I said, um, this, this, this is all driven by expectation. Like I was looking for a television. Once the price goes up, actually that is bad thing for me. But I anticipate the price to go up even further in the future. So now you have needs, you want to buy a TV, so you would buy it, even though it's more, exen it's more expensive than before. But you expect it, it's even more expensive. It's going to scare you off the I, No, no, I understand that, but it just seems contradictory to what we've learned about expansionary monetary policy. And yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. At a certain so, point, does the cost of borrowing yeah, yeah, yeah. go I will, cost demand? I will get to this point later. Yes, it cannot go over. Like, if you continue raising the interest rate, <laughs> We are, we are answering questions, so it doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> right? 
yeah, we will get it later. They cannot go over. It cannot go um, this way forever because, in general, higher interest rate is the um, the way to cool off the uh, the economic growth because the higher rate means the less borrowing, less lending. Yeah. Yes. I was just wondering with the Fed much more open about its intentions these days than it's ever been. What kind of role would it play just for them to say they're going to do it in three or six months as opposed to actually doing it? Would it still spur that kind of buying that we're talking about? Yes. I will get to that. Oh. That is way later. I actually have that on my slide if I have a chance to show it to you. Yes, they have been, uh, uh, they are trying to make their policy transparent and they have all this forward guidance, but um, in the recent months, they have been changing their forward guidance, so it has already become difficult for the public to borrow. And um, I would say um, there is no timeline and this is inappropriate for the public to ask central bank for a timeline or a very specific plan because everyone is watching nobody's 100 percent sure what is going to happen and so um forward guidance to me it's um it's not very effective but uh, this is nice try for the central bank to promise people like oh don't worry i wouldn't raise the interest rate but they keep changing it Keep changing the promise, so yes, you promise something today, I wouldn't care, I mean. So we have to come up with a better way, but I'm telling you there's no specific plan, and I cannot offer you the timeline, and I cannot offer the central bank what they need to do. Everyone is observing and uh, adjust their plan according to the assessment of economic condi conditions. I, I will get to that if I have a chance, and as a reserve, how much time do I have? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, actually, this is a good way to end my presentation because I have much more to offer. This is just more like introduction part. I have like, oh, what is objectives and what is the strategies. So, um, if you are interested, you want to know why why things are not working and what is going to happen and what should we do and what does it mean to your life, read my article. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, I will put this slide somewhere so if you are interested, you can take a look. This is my estimate of the uh, assets reserve, how much assets reserve has to be reduced to be normal. I'll just show it very quickly for a minute. Yeah, how do we do for the Fed's balance sheet? And what is the options, and how do we get there? This is the forward guidance. I uh, this is three changes which happened recently, and uh, oh yeah, um, like um, like I said, um, between December two thousand twelve and October twenty thirteen, that is their statement. And uh, in December two thousand thirteen, they changed their words, and then last month. Oh no, in March, not last month. In March, they change it again. So yes, um, they are very careful about what they say. They said, I never said 6.5% unemployment is a trigger for us to do something. But they do change their wording and um, uh, move toward uh, like more actually, more vague statement. So they drop 65% uh, threshold in March this year, and who knows what's going to happen. You know, they can change their words, but, uh, but that's true. I'm not saying they didn't keep their promise because they never said the 6.5% unemployment with a trigger. But um, I'm just saying this forward guidance seems not to be very effective. And um, this is, um, I, I, I think the Fed has to, if they decide to increase the, sh the rates, they have to do it step by step. As, and this is to answer your question, it's not going forever, because there, um, there is a level at which the interest cannot go further to uh, spur lending or borrowing. So if, I don't know what's the level it is, because everything is different. And, and if we, now, for example, it interest rate, the short rates is about 2%, and the lending has already slowed or stopped. 
and if you raise it further, it probably will discourage lending. And but if if at this point inflation is a big concern, maybe you can raise the rates further, but do not expect the uh, lending to go up, but it can curb the inflation. So it's all based on the current, the current economic condi conditions. You take your move, and then you watch, and then um, you make decision for the next step, and then you have to assess the economic conditions again. So for the public, I think, Okay, this is that's a lot. Conclusions. Actually, I only have one conclusion, which is nobody knows what's going on and what <laughs> is going to happen. That's the only takeaway I want you to have from today's talk. I do offer my 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 suggestions. I do offer it, but uh, I'm not saying there's a timeline or specific plan the central bank should take. And. Um, it, the economy has been correlated, like every aspect of the economy has been correlated to each other. So this is the whole system. There's different signs toward um, pointing to different directions, but all the directions are correlated. So once one part fails, the whole system falls apart. So, so everyone should be, the central bank has been super careful, but as the public General public, it is important for you to be aware of this complexity and do not over expect the central bank. Do not overreact to any policy change. So if you are interested in specific suggestions, strategies, read my paper or call me. You can interview me and quote my work. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, do, please. Do, is it safe to say then through that a lot of this proves that you can't really manipulate demand with interest rates? I mean, if I'm a business person, I don't care what the interest rate is. Yeah. It's a number that I plug into my formula, yeah. and I have an expectation of demand, and I can borrow to meet that demand yeah. and still That's, make a profit based yeah. on the interest rate at the time. Yeah. And if I can, I go forward. If I, if I can't, I don't. But the interest rate manipulation does not influence that demand. It might make me a little bit more willing if there's some demand there, marginal demand. Mm -hmm. If I'm a little bit skittish, but if if I'm just cautious and, and no demand and I don't sense any demands there, I'm not going to borrow. Because all I cover, I cover banking, all I hear from the bankers on demand, they just say, look, the only people who want to borrow right now are people who should be borrowing. Well, you are absolutely right. You are talking like an economist, but <laughs> but the demand, um, we, I said that. The rising interest rate would trigger lending or borrowing under one assumption that there is unsatisfied needs of business or borrowing. So people have needs. They can increase their production, but they are not very positive. They don't have very positive outlook for the economy. So they, are, they have been observing. And also, like... Um, um, if you have different interest rate, which is the cost of borrowing, right? And you have so many different projects, it could be, yes, you are right, maybe lower or higher interest rate doesn't matter as long as you can make profit. But higher interest rate probably can make profitable project earlier to be unprofitable. It is also possible. And also we assume because all of these strategies and the one is under one consumption economy is going to improve continuously in the future. So we will have, we hope we will have more needs of businesses going forward. So we will have more demand for loans. And in, in this case, you just raise interest rate or lower interest rate. It could be crucial to bank lending. Can I add something? Yeah. I think, and tell me if you agree or not, but the Fed is more effective at slowing things down by raising interest rates than it is at speeding things yeah. up by lowering interest rates. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, what is the rationale for current concern about inflation, given that it just has failed to show up? Why not wait <laughs> until it does show up and say, you know, 
three and a half, four percent. Oh, okay, now we're there. Um, uh, and you know, I mean, do exactly what, what you were suggesting, well, which is that, that you get a very quick response when you raise rates on you know on a whole bunch of levels that included. They do have in every meeting. FOMC meeting, they do have expectation. They ask all the economists, the policymakers, about what is your ex estimate for long term in, in infl inflation. But there's no measure. Even just for current inflation, we have the data for price level. We still it's still up for days, up for debate that if the measure is appro appropriate, like CPI or PCE price in. Tax, even to measure the current inflation. Sure. But for the future inflation, yeah. it's just forecasting. And forecasting is never right. I had an infl inflation forecasting model, which is to estimate inflation going forward, like you said, it would be more important, not just you know, focused on the current inflation, because car the current inflation is never a concern for years. But, um, well, my project got stopped. And um, forecasting has been a very difficult subject in economics. And everyone is trying to forecast the future. And if you are able to do so, you'll be famous. You will be rich. But, I mean, is, there, but, is there any reason not to just sort of ignore <coughs> inflation as a concern for, I mean, until it actually shows up, you know, current inflation is at a rate, you know. Yeah, this is every time they show the current inflation every time. So that's the how you said that they're going to track inflation, right? It's like current inflation is under 2%, you would like to tell the public. And if it's to 3%, you would tell the public, yeah, it's 3%, we have to take actions. I don't quite understand your question. I mean, they are checking inflation every month. Yeah, I mean, but is there, is there any <coughs> reason for concern about inflation? Oh, they are not concerned about inflation. I, I, I mean, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the Federal Reserve statement, they always say, oh, inflation is not worrisome, it's not our concern, you know, it's under control. They are not concerned. But I'm just saying, you know, we have to look forward because the, the economics always, economy always act on ex expectations. So we have to, um, to estimate, even though I'm never right, but we still need to try to forecast what is the future inflation look like. And then we make decisions now to respond to the future prediction of inflation. But you are right, they, uh, they always, um, they check the, in the current inflation and they said it's not a concern. They are not are a concern. you worried though about a possibility in, yeah. which, in which the inflation does remain you know, so current inflation rates are extraordinarily unworrisome. If anything, we're worried about deflation instead. And I don't think deflation is going to be an issue. It's in Europe. It's a problem in Europe now, but it's not going to be a problem in the U.S. I'm more worried about in, mm -hmm. infl inflation, not but, deflation. But, so, but, mm -hmm. sort of, but you're worried that there would be a circumstance into which long term, <coughs> even though current, you know, mm -hmm. that, that we would get to a point at which whatever actions we could take mm -hmm. to head off inflation at mm -hmm. that point, raising interest um, mm -hmm. yeah. would not be enough to head off future inflation. Is that correct? Like, you know, no. Words, no. I think raising interest rates will um, be an effective tool or strategy to curb infl in inflation. And I'm only worried that the longer term inflation likelihood is there. But once it happens, I believe we have effective tool to fight it. Inflation is not going to go wild like we had in the 1980s. So I think also one of the things is that um, in general we think that the Fed has tools to, to curb inflation, mm -hmm. but there's never been $4.5 trillion in excess yeah. reserves before. Right. So we don't know. We don't really know. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so I think really that's why Joe's probably expressing some concern. Yeah. Yes. I was just wondering if you thought the Fed has these programs to help banks you know, save money for capital reasons. Um, I was just, is, do you think it's part of their discussion or should it be about whether people should be saving money? Because right now rates are so low that you really need to put it in a bank, forget it, or a CD or a bond. Or, oh. I mean, if, if so much of the crisis was caused by too much individual borrowing in certain ways, oh. should, should that play a role or is it just kind of... Well, I'm not... Like, 
licensed to give this uh, personal financial investment suggestion, you could talk with our EIS company. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they will charge you, by the way. <laughs> EIER is non-profit, but EIS is profit organization. But my son's advice is that it's what you should spend the money because that will save you. Yeah. Um, you should spend the money which will definitely help the economy, but do not spend money too much. Do not spend the money you do not own now. So that's the, uh, how we ended up with this huge credit debt in this country. And, and even for the country, not just in individuals, you, we import goods which we do not pay for. We just you know, accumulate our international debt and uh, let our children, next generations, take care of it, so I don't know. It's, uh, it involves a lot of uh, issues, not just economic issues, it's so also social issues. If you want, your, you would like to put the pressure on your children, you just keep spending now, but. Um. Yeah, forget, forget zero population growth. <laughs> yeah, you should yeah. borrow to buy a house now at 4%. Because that's cheap, right? Yeah. Right? You got to learn inflation, you inflate away that mortgage. <laughs> Oh, don't give right. advice. <laughs> it seems like a pretty good idea. He's an economist. Yeah. Yeah. They did that in California, and then home prices plummeted by 50%. Yeah. Right. But when this, uh, if the Fed started, starts uh, selling off their assets, um, I can tell you, especially the treasury bonds, the bond market will be, um, will be fluctuating, and uh, the bond price will go down, and the rate will go up. So it will cost the hot money. So we, uh, switching from the stock market to the bond market. So if you are heavily invested on stocks, you should be careful. If you see the sign of selling off the Fed's assets, so you should be you careful about the stock them. invest. Um, well, actually, I had some um, analysis of uh, on whether or not they should <coughs> sell off their assets. Um, I think in the near term, no. Short answer is no, but uh, in the longer term, if we can see more positive sign of the economy and uh, we see the sign of overheating housing market, if economy is going better than expected, yes, it's possible and it's advisable to sell off those assets. And I, c I actually have some charts to show even the housing market, um, even we raise the long-term rates on market, mortgage, but uh, we have this affordability data shows most of the houses are still affordable. So even we raise the long-term rates, the housing market is not going to crash. So in my view, if uh, things are going better than you expected, and we actually see this uh, sign of another housing bubble, yes, the Fed should sell their long-term assets, but it's not happening anytime soon. Yes? Do you worry about the employment situation at all? Because that seems to be the <coughs> biggest concern in terms of raising rates. Oh, I'm, I was afraid you guys couldn't ask me about that because <laughs> <laughs> unemployment, we have so many experts on unemployment on the labor market, so I try to take stay out of it. But um, well, we should probably should talk with Polina about that uh, because <laughs> I'm afraid I'm going to say something stupid. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unemployment, and I think unemployment should not be the mandate of the central bank. And oh. there's no way. I mean, because um, thanks to the famous Phillips curve model, unemployment is um, attacked to economic growth and infla in, in inflation, but it sh really shouldn't be a mandate or objective for the central bank to affect the labor market. I mean, there are so many factors which could affect the labor market. It could be the product productivity or the, the, the changing nature of population, you know, all kinds of social problems. It's not just it's just not just the money or money creation problem that central bank is supposed to do could determine the labor market. So the short answer is, I don't know. Yes. I was just wondering about in terms of what the central bank should really be mandated to do. I mean, if 
traditionally there was a little bit of a balance between the monetary policy and yeah. the fiscal policy, but yeah. now basically I know. the legislative there process are, is broken. There is no pondering, yeah. It's like, um, <coughs> is it up to the Fed to do everything now? Really yeah, it's like everyone is expecting the central bank to save them, to do everything they can, even something they, they can't, but they still need to save, save people. So um, actually, only in the recent years, not recent years, maybe the recent decades, the central bank become more popular. Before, even if they had meeting, they have announcement, and nobody paid much an attention. Now everyone expects them to save their life, but um, I would say central bank's ability is very limited. And um, the role they have to, pr they, they are supposed to play is to control over the money supply or interest rate, which is a secondary target. But monetary part of money supply is hard to measure. And uh, according to some models, money supply has lost a uh, significant relationship between economic growth. So interest rate apparently is a better target. But anyway, the central bank is only supposed to control over the money supply interest rate and printing money getting to more money outside is not going to get you richer because the economic growth is about goods and services you produced, not because how much money you have, how much US dollar you have in <coughs> circulation. Money creation will only have one impact in the longer term, which is infl inflation. So, how to help with the economy, how to improve your productivity, how to um, help people with uh, getting more skills, and how to produce more to improve our lives. It's really not everything the central bank can do. Yes, please. Uh, I'm talking to Amish yesterday about the Basel III, mm -hmm. that when, the, when, when we moved from Basel I to Basel II, mm -hmm. the, that the capital education issue was uh, was lowered to seven seven and a half percent in the hope that it, it will make the bank the bank pay the bank more strong to face with any uh, adversities. But and, and <coughs> at, at the same time, we are also planning to while moving from Basel two to Basel three, we are again planning to adjust some that kind of ratio. So do you think that that will be helpful in dealing with future kind of recession or something? Basel 2, Basel 3, Basel 3 is I just um, saw the news last month about the Basel 3 is finally, you know, uh, kicked in. Um, I think um, there has been a lot of debate about if this is too much uh, financial regulation. And um, like I said, the Basel 3 requires banks to rely less on the short term assets and you have to increase your leverage ratio, which means you have to carry higher quality assets. Yes. And all these kind of things will discourage the, um, the bank's lending activities. But, um, but due to this financial crisis of 2007 and 2008, people got a panic, you know, because a lot of people blame on uh, the lack of regulations, which is the major reason of this financial crisis, because everyone was overtaking risk, but there's no regulation to tell people you cannot do it. Because so now I would say, even though there's too restrict regulation now, but it's not going to relax. I mean, there's only going to be more and more regulations, and I'm afraid. I'm afraid those. Uh, Tighter than ever, regulations would definitely um, affect um, affect the um, financial system, and you know, lending, borrowing is very it's cru crucial for economic growth. But uh, since bad things happen, this is the lesson we learned from the bad things. So we created more solutions. Um, I don't know if the solution is going to be working or not, but I would say they are not going to change it. They are not going to relax the regulation. They're just going to have more and more. But you know what? Every time after you learn the lesson, you change your solutions, you think you have a better one, but later you always have another problem. That's for sure. <laughs> so, and I'm not really, you know, um, finance person, so I really don't know about what is 
uh, specifically this regulation or this act tell, tells us? Because I was trying to read the act. It was like, how many pages? Oh my gosh, I just fell asleep once again and again, so I gave up. So I really cannot tell you as an expert what those acts is about and what is its effect. I just, yeah, I, I'm not very sure, not 100% sure. Having worked at State Street Bank, I'll say that uh -huh. Dodd-Frank created a lot of jobs. Oh. <laughs> That's <Well>. good. <laughs> yes? Let's, let's take it offline again. You're a really great job. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.